Okay, we're going to start now, yeah? Okay. So, thank you all for joining us. Um, this is the second public launch of Unsettling Dramaturgy. The first happened last week at the Festival of Live Digital Art in Kingston, Ontario, and we're really excited um, to be here uh, with this truncated time and these technical difficulties to share with you um, the work that we've been up to. Uh, many of us in this room and many of those watching via live stream are visitors to the lands we're on today. The land we're calling in from is Columbia College and it owes its vitality to generations who have come before. Some were brought forcibly to this land. Some came here in search of ownership or simply a better life and some have lived and stewarded this land for countless generations from time immemorial. In a spirit of making erased histories visible, we begin today by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral and illegally occupied territories of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawomi, who are not relics of the past, but rather continue to steward this land today with care, vitality, and tradition. Their relations are numerous throughout Tr Turtle Island, and they continue to grow. We we'll pay respects to their elders, past and present, and to their future generations. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. I want to thank Tara Moses, who is on the call today, um, for sharing that language with us and for helping us to open in a good way. Um, my name is Mia Susan Amir. I'm the convener of Unsettling Dramaturgy. Un Unsettling Dramaturgy started out of a series of conversations that happened at the LMDA conference uh, in 2017. And then bubbled inside of me uh, for quite some time. And then we were lucky, I was lucky to be awarded a Bly Creative Fellowship to support this now ongoing project. Um, in a moment, we're all gonna introduce ourselves, but um, Ru and I, Ru, who is the co-coordinator of this project, will now introduce um, Unsettling Dramaturgy to you all. Uh, in the briefest of ways, and then we'll explain how we're going to share our time together today. Does that sound cool? Yeah? Right on. Where do you want to start? Absolutely. So, Unsettling Dramaturgy is an ongoing project uh, bringing together Crip and Indigenous dramaturgs from across so called Canada and the United States who work in theater, dance, and experimental performance. We're using digital platforms to gather, to build relationships, to explore and document the critical convergences and divergences in our experiences and work, to amplify crip and indigenous aesthetics, ethics, practices, and leadership in our local, national, and international performance ecologies. We're here to push the conversations from inclusion to centering, from reconciliation to unsettling and decolonization. My turn? Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't see you, so you can't. Oh, yeah. Yes, your turn. <laughs> right. uh, you're behind us um, on a screen. This project proposes uh, a continuation of the thriving legacies of leadership and innovation that shape Indigenous and Crip dramaturgies, but in a whole new way by bringing together artists from communities that have been historically excluded from mainstream performance ecologies and which have been further siloed into spaces of making that have systematically prevented critical cross-community collaboration. So we're dismantling those silos um, to advance emerging conversations exploring the conflicts of leadership and representation in creation and production as relate to indigenous sovereignty and deaf and disability culture in the arts. 
We're generating a platform for self-determined encounter and exchange where our local bodies of knowledge can be activated. On to you, Ru. It bears importance to share that this project does not aim to collapse Crip and Indigenous dramaturgies and experiences. The exclusions that our communities face emerge from very specific historical, cultural, and political contexts. Further, the ableism, sameism, and oddism that deaf, disabled, and mad artists face emerge from colonial ways of assigning value and human dignity. We use Crip to include those who identify as mad, sick, and disabled, as well as those who are deemed disabled by society and or medical institutions, whether or not they themselves accept that term. For example, those for whom deafness is a cultural identity, not a medical condition. We use the word Crip as a political intervention to turn attention onto and to disrupt, as our collaborator, Carmen Papalia, who's not joining us today, writes, the disabling conditions that limit a person and or community's agency and potential to thrive. And we're using the term indigenous with an acknowledgement of the many complex ways that community, family, belonging, polity, and heritage interact with systems of state recognition. So the words Crip and Indigenous are both used as shorthand and not intended to generalize or reduce our vast multiplicity of identities, experiences, and affiliations. So what we've been up to uh, for, the, for the last six or so months, Ru and I have been scheming, dreaming, talking, uh, imagining structures, engaging in conversations with folks who uh, we knew and who were recommended to us because we knew that there was no way that we would know everyone that we should know and we still don't know everyone that we should know who should be in the conversation with us. And um, at this point, we've had three convenings. They all happen on Zoom, as is happening right now. Um, and we've been working to really uh, lean into um, relationship building and finding out what the basic threads of relationship are that are important to us if we're going to co-create uh, and co-dream and co-theorize and co-enact together. And so that's what our convenings have really looked like to date. Um, I'm happy to share some of the access practices that we've built um, to support um, the participation of all of our uh, cohort, which not everybody is represented here today. There's about 12 folks from across Canada, so-called Canada and the United States, who are participating thus far. And uh, HowlRound and SpiderWeb Show, uh, which is kind of the Canadian sister organization to HowlRound, um, are both partnering with us and will be working with us as we, um, when we're ready and on our terms, uh, are, are interested in sharing our discoveries, uh, our learnings, and uh, the documentation uh, from this project. So that's what we've been up to. Does this make sense so far? Right on. Okay, cool. <laughs> Do you want to tell them about the panel? Yeah, so um, on today's panel, we wanted to demonstrate for you a little bit of what our practice looks like. So through this format, we're letting you in on a conversation that we're having with and for each other, for and with Crip and Indigenous dramaturgs. We invite you to participate as witnesses with that understanding. This is our radical act of centering our practices, voices, experiences, to undermine the ways in which we are often asked, asked to perform these conversations to educate others. This event will be live streamed with closed captions as well. There are no closed captions, actually. But this- I just lied. <laughs> you didn't lie, it was in the script, it was my fault. Um, but uh, it will be transcribed after. Okay, post, post oh, Do you wanna edit that live now? Great. <laughs> We're gonna Google Doc together. Um, <laughs> So, so um, yeah. oh, no, go. You're good. go ahead, Mia. Yeah. No, go, go. Okay, so I was going to say that uh, now we wanted to um, do our panelist self introduction. So, we're going to take about 15 minutes for that so that you can hear a little bit about us and where we're coming from and our access needs and a little bit of our practices. So, maybe it makes the most sense for the people in the room to, to start off. Would y'all be willing to start off? 
I can start, I can start, okay. Uh, and so again, just to emphasize, this is how we conduct ourselves with each other. And we're letting you in on that today. And then we're going to give you a chance to conduct yourselves a tiny bit with each other. Um, it won't be very extensive because we only have 40 minutes now. We'll do our best. Uh, so my name is Mia Susan Amir. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, today I have short, somewhat disheveled hair. I'm a white-skinned individual. I'm wearing a, a purple kind of hoodie, but the hood kind of extends itself in a kind of uh, unwieldy way. Um, and underneath my hoodie, I'm wearing a really cute um, jumper. And um, where I am, well, I am, as, as I mentioned, I'm here at Columbia College. And um, I was born in Israel-occupied Palestine. I'm a Jew of mixed Ashkenazi and Sephardic ascent. And I live most of the time on the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, colonially known as Vancouver, British Columbia. My access needs. Um, despite appearances, or maybe not, I'm not doing very well today. My health is poopy. So um, that means bunch of things. Maybe I'll step out and I'll hand it over to Ruth to hold it all. Um, but what it probably means is that it might take me some time to catch and form my thoughts. And so patience with that will be appreciated and not completing my, my sentences for me is something I will um, appreciate. In terms of my praxis, um, I work at the intersection of creative and community practice. I'm a dramaturg, director, maker of transdisciplinary works. Um, I'm really interested in how we um, democratize narrative production, starting from the site of sensation. And uh, I'm, I'm multiply affiliated with a bunch of different and exciting projects and organizations, and I'm really excited to be positioned as such. And a lot of my work is taking place um, not in Vancouver, but cross-continentally. And uh, so I've been leaning into these digital uh, venues a lot, and um, as a disabled artist, it's been really interesting to be able to have that flexibility of form, uh, to be able to work kind of on my own terms in my own ways, often from home. Uh, so yeah, that's that's some of the stuff I'm up to. Okay, um, I'm Andrea Kovich. My pronouns are she, her, her. I'm kind of a white female with a little longer than chin length brown hair, a black sweater, and gray shirt. And um, so I live on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, particularly or specifically the Duwamish peoples. Um, my access needs, um, it's kind of the end of the day for me, so I'm really kind of dragging and I need a nap. So, um, hopefully I won't be slower than usual, but feeling a little fuzzy right now, so, um, and as far as my practice, um, I've been focusing lately on the work that matters to me most, like centering the disabled perspective in theater. And that includes like working with this group and um, writing some articles and, and starting a um, rehearsals in July on a production that focuses on disabled people, so I'm really enjoying having this um, time to center my identity, and I'm also really enjoying working with these loving, generous people. Kara, would you mind going next? Sure thing. 
So here's Jay, everyone. Hello, my name is Tara Moses. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I have very long, very straight, very dark hair, almost black, a brown, dark brown slash black. Um, I have a like medium brown skin tone, although I'm being washed out right now by apartment lighting, as we all know is great. I have on a black off the shoulder top that has some pink and purple floral detailing on it. Um, I am based and live in the uh, in Osage, Chicago, and Muskoka Nation in Oklahoma. So that is the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. Um, I am from Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I am a citizen of Seminole Nation, and I also have shared and mixed ancestry in Muskoka Nation, Muskoka and uh, Oklahoma Cherokee. Um, in regards to my access needs, if everyone would not mind speaking up and being very clear so that I can hear, uh, that would be very great and appreciative. Um, and then for my praxis, I am a director, a playwright, and an artistic director. Being a native artist, I find myself thrust into the dramaturgical role often. And so, um, in recent years, I've also been identified as a dramaturg. Um, and so, what I do is a lot of Native artistry, a lot of Native theater. Um, but furthermore, I am very interested in doing decolonized Shakespeare. And so, which is possible. Uh, so, I've been doing that. I recently came up with a production of Hamlet that was set in Great Cold, New Mexico, um, when it was one of those indigenous cultures during the end of this And so it has a very different meaning. It works very well with that play. Um, and not just with classical work like Shakespeare, or a lot of Greek tragedies as well. But furthermore, how can we bring decolonized and indigenous storytelling into contemporary theater that may not necessarily be written by a native artist or have the intentionality to be decolonized? Um, and so that's really my, I would say, area of expertise, because I don't need to become an expert book yet. Um, that's where I thrive, that's where I work, and what I'm really passionate about. And furthermore, I'm really passionate about accessibility um, and the really full meaning of the word. So accessibility for those with all levels of abilities, as well as socioeconomic accessibility, um, caregiver accessibility, um, so helping those who um, have young children or have other family members or other individuals who they do care after, and how theater can be more accommodating in regards to the personal room, um, the actual buildings, um, et cetera. Um, yes, and I'm also a uh, consultant with Groundwater Arts, which focuses on climate justice that's centered around indigenous folks and other people of color, um, as well as equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. I'm on a lot of other committees and things, but I think that's all for now. Thank you, Udo. Thank you, Tara. Joe, will you go next? Ali, Bojo, Jill Carter, Nudishnikas, Anishinaabe, Kai, Ashkenazi, Kwandao, Toronto, Nagaranto, Chiki Wendy, Nudumtapa, Shomaspan, Wigwemekong, Ki Okchipan. My name is Jill Carter. I am a mixed blood Anishinaabe. Uh, that's Eastern Woodlands, specifically Odawa, one of the three fires confederacy. Um, uh, mixed blood Ashkenazi and Anishinaabe woman. I was born and raised here in Takaranto, the place where the trees grow out of the water, uh, Toronto. Um, uh, but my late grandfather, my traditional um, lands are, uh, of my late grandfather are with Wimakon on Manitoulin Island. Um, Toronto, is, uh, Toronto is a gathering place. It has been so for 13,500 years. Um, it is a gathering place and a place of trade and commerce today because it was always this. It wasn't uh, it wasn't made this way when Europe uh, stepped upon its shores. Um, we uh, are blessed with uh, three key waterways that, uh, that, uh, that connect 
the lake of the woods in the far north to Lake Ontario in the south, um, which then takes us out to the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Atlantic Ocean. So it has been a connector of indigenous nations from north to south uh, for thousands of years. It has been stewarded by multiple nations. Um, the Wandat, uh, the Haudenosaunee people of the Longhouse, and specifically the Seneca Nation of the Longhouse people, um, and more recently, the uh, Mississauga, Mississaugic, uh, Anishinaabek, my cousin. So the Anishinaabek uh, from the river of many mouths. Um, uh, I'm very grateful to, to be on these lands today, uh, to be speaking to you from Taganonto. Um, and I'm very grateful to meet you all through the airwaves or fiber cables or whatever <laughs> across uh, these lands. Um, I, 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 I also, I work at, I'm a theater maker, a Nanishinaabe theater maker, um, <coughs> who is also now in her later years an educator. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and uh, Center for Theatre, Drama and Performance Studies in the Transitional Year Program and in Indigenous Studies at U of T. Um, my, my pronouns are she and her. I'm wearing um, a light denim jean jacket. My hair is because I'm lazy. I have dark hair pulled out. It's six o'clock. You heard that, that was my computer speaking to me. He <laughs> <laughs> has to tell me. I've programmed him to be scary. <laughs> so that I will get back to work. Um, uh, my hair is, dark hair is uh, pulled back in a scrunchie. I have medium um, dark skin, uh, brown eyes and orange lipstick. Um, and um, that's, I think, what I look like. <laughs> um, and uh, my pronouns are she and her. My praxis, um, well, as I said, I'm an educator. Uh, I'm an educator and I'm a theater maker, specifically a performer, uh, a director, and a dramaturg. Um, I strive now in my older years to support the development of new indigenous works and to disseminate artistic objectives, process, and outcomes through community-driven research projects. Um, when I began as a, a, a doing my master's and then my PhD in 2001, there was, a, there was no indigenous scholarship to speak of on indigenous theater were settler scholars writing about indigenous theater and scholars in Europe writing about indigenous theater from these shores, but the, the, there was no scholarship. So uh, I began to try to forge my own way through it um, and uh, work from the little I know about my own culture and the, the much I began to learn by working with uh, theater makers. Uh, like Spider Woman Theater, Monique Mujica, um, Jenny Lanzon, um, etc. Um, uh, my, my practices and my research questions revolve around the same things the mechanics of story creation, the processes of delivery, and the mechanics of affect. And I'm very interested um, in theater. Uh, the people that I enjoy working with and that I do work with now are not are not people who uh, necessarily make theater to educate settler audiences. We make theater; they make theater, and I make theater for um, our communities, for our people, um, with very specific goals in mind. Many of these uh, often are just. Uh, our, our healing, our, 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 our goals around healing, and in a sense, I've, theater has healed me, indigenous theater. Um, I regard it as a ceremony in a public space, um, and, uh, and I, uh, I enjoy working that way and towards, uh, to, 
towards those transformations. And I think that's probably all I should say right now. Do you have any, do you have any access needs today? Um, I don't think so. I may stand up, and if I do this, it's because I'm still recovering from a back injury. Um, thank you. Tanaka, everyone. Niat Ru, Yen Isware, Gabe Tabare. Hi, my name is uh, Rue George Warren, or my legal name is Deleslin, so you'll see both. Um, I'm a citizen of Catawba Indian Nation, um, the only federally recognized tribe in South Carolina. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them. Uh, visual description, I have white skin, I'm in a kind of brownish shirt, gym shorts, <laughs> which is the magic of being able to do a live stream, is that you can uh, dress how you want to. Um, I've got short, curly brown hair, and blue eyes, and a beard. Um, I, like I said, I'm Catawba, and I have the immense privilege of having grown up on uh, my people's traditional land, and I currently live on our reservation, um, which is uh, just fantastic. Um, access needs. My access needs today are that there's a lot of, I get very easily distracted and there's a lot of sounds, like there's a fly that's just doing the most over here. Um, there's some res cats outside my door wanting me to feed them, my cats wanting me to feed them. Um, so if I look distracted, it, I probably am, so uh, just patience would be appreciated. <laughs> And then in terms of praxis, um, so I, kind of, I come at theater kind of sideways. My, tradition, my training is in operatic performance and musical and traditional musical composition. Um, but after graduating from my program, I realized I didn't like the strictures on it, so I moved pretty rapidly into performance art and experimental work. Um, today, I continue doing those, those, uh, those kinds of works. Um, usually by traveling uh, to other places, but I also spend the majority of my time working on community organizing, particularly around Catawba food sovereignty and Catawba language revitalization, and thinking about how performance and theater practice and dramaturgy can actually come into these community movements um, to inform or bolster uh, the work that we're doing there. Uh, for example, today I just spent maybe 10 hours coding a website for our language project. So I'm also just seeing numbers and brackets and parentheses running in front of my eyes. But um, I think that's all uh, that, I've, that I'll disclose for right now. So uh, thank you. Mia, yeah, do you want to uh, offer the activity for the folks in the room? I was going to ask, do you think we should do it? We have almost no time left. I know. <laughs> Will you all give us 10 more minutes? Because 10 minutes got shaved from the top of our time. And if you have to leave, that's totally cool. But if we could, if I could just get some indicator from like most of you, like a hand or a, yes. yeah, right on. OK, cool. Let's do it. They gave us 10 more minutes. How nice of them. So gracious. <laughs> OK, so we wanted to offer the way we introduce ourselves to you. So, here's the instruction. Here's, here's the invitation. Uh, find a person, maybe somebody that you don't know, but that you feel you will feel comfortable uh, introducing yourself to in this room. And you'll share, and unfortunately we don't have a slide um, because tech difficulties, but um, your name, your pronouns, and you can share what you want of this. There's, there's not, you can opt in and out. Uh, a visual description of yourself today, right now, in this moment. Where, who, and whose land you're from. So where, who, and whose land you're from. One thing that brought you to this panel. And any access needs that you might have. Access is for everyone, and so sometimes folks walk into a room and they're like, ah, oh, I don't have any access needs, because it's a really new thing for us to like get to check in about what we need in order to be able to be as present as we want to be in a space. 
And often we're performing all kinds of labor that happens outside of space or invisibly inside of space to be able to be present. So if there's something that you want to share with your partner um, about your access needs today or some labor that you've performed in order to get here that would be useful to be visibilized for you, please do share that. Um, should I repeat those or are you all good? You're good, yeah. Do you want to write it written on the whiteboard for reference? You're good. Thank you so much for that offer. Um, okay, so you have four minutes. Huh? <laughs> Two minutes per person to get real, to get close. today and reflect on one thing that you're taking away from this uh, panel, because we're not going to have a chance for questions. We're really going to center the voices of um, the colloquium members. So um, I just want to encourage that that could be a possibility, uh, because these conversations can often be really big. And so um, just as a way of grounding and, and starting to embody some of the information and awakening or understanding or ideas or new words that we receive or hear, um, that that could be a possibility. Um, 
I did want to ask, does anyone have any access needs in the room that you'd like us to know about in order to orient this conversation in such a way that you can be as present as you want to be today? No pressure. Yeah. I guess I just, and this is maybe the opposite of what you're getting at, it felt sort of trivializing for me to say that I have access needs hmm. because things seem pretty well designed for me to get around on. Um, so I don't know, I just, I don't know. It doesn't feel quite right. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Hey Mia, is it possible to to um, for the, um, the, but the what was your name? Waylon. Waylon said that it felt a bit trivializing to talk about their access needs because things were designed in such a way that your access needs were being met. Right. Great. Okay. So that's true for some of us. Some of us, our access needs are being met sometimes. Access is also like a constantly fluctuating thing, just like we and our bodies are constantly fluctuating. So it's something that can change and it's dynamic and in a, in, a, in a different process where we have more time together, it's something we would continue to check in about. It's not assumed as a static state. You were this way at 4 p.m. Why are you not that way at 6? Yeah, that's not the assumption. Anybody else? Any access needs that will help you be present? for the remainder of our time together. Uh, what you did earlier was really helpful, just repeating into the microphone, um, so that it was heard louder, that's great. Great. Feel free to repeat that if people want. <laughs> <laughs> it was helpful for me to repeat in the microphone what was said in the room. I, I can't pretend that I've that, um, Places like these conferences that are really intellectually stimulating, I can take in all the information, the names, and uh, the references. And so I have to continue both consuming calories and burning them somehow. It's like that's why I'm standing right now because after hours of exciting conversation, uh, I, I feel like breaking down. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do you a disservice in repeating that in conference environments like this, we're consuming a lot of intellectual information and that there's a need to continue to consume and exert calories in order to digest. Or it's like I need the calories, need the calories to, 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 to feed my brain. To feed the brain. And obviously if I eat too much, then it just kind of in like a, if I eat too much, excess. it results in an excess. And so there's a feeling of like about to break down this because of excess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. So in this space, please feel free to move about, stand up, sit down. It doesn't matter if you're in the front. If you want to lie on the ground, that's cool. Do what you need to do. If you want to leave, great. If you want to come back, also great. It's all good. Um, so for the remainder of our short time together, we had wanted to have a conversation. And we have three, well, 10, but three awesomely huge questions that we wanted to address. And I'm wondering, maybe I could just read all of the questions out, and then whatever we say is the best thing that we need to say right now, yeah? Yes. Okay, yes. does that work for all of you? Yes. Cool. So these are the questions. And you can even write these down because they might be cool questions for you at some point in your life. Or I can email them. <laughs> if you want them emailed, come after and I'll email them to you. That might be easier. So what does crib and or indigenous dramaturgy mean to you? We're really not trying to create static definitions of our practices through our work together. So we're really leaning into our embodied experiences of what our work looks and feels like in its specificity. So that's what we want to share from is, what, what does it mean to us? How do you, and when I'm saying you, it's directed towards us, not you right now, but maybe you too. Uh, how do you experience, deal with, address the tension that exists between the desire and need 
to unsettle mainstream approaches to dramaturgy and the desire and need to simply center your communities in the context of your dramaturgical practice. So this tension of needing to like be in these more mainstream spaces and then really just wanting to center our own communities, uh, experiences, aesthetics, and ways. And then the third, fourth, fifth, sixth questions are, how do we create cross-community relational solidarity between indigenous and crip communities of artistic practice? How do we unsettle access? How do we amplify access within indigenous practice? So these are some of the questions that have come up through the course of our encounter with each other, and they're not questions that we have landed on answers to. They're like alive. They're super alive. I think they're alive. Are they alive? Yeah, they're alive. OK, um, just as we are. And so those are the questions that we will somehow, in some part, respond to each of us. And that's what we'll do for the next 20 minutes, which means we each have four minutes. Right? Yeah. 21 minutes, so 4.333 or something. Great. So whoever feels moved to start should. Yeah, I wanted to um, just give voice to the fact that Jill and Tara and I were, we had about 10 to 15 minutes before this started, where it was just the three of us on the call. And we were having a really, really, really interesting conversation around indigenous theater stateside and also in so-called Canada, um, talking about where the past trends are, what the current situation is. And one question that came from that that I was, that I'm really interested in is, um, and I hope they're okay with me sharing this, is Tara was saying, you know, there's kind of this moment happening around indigenous theater where it's becoming trendy, um, but in a very specific way. And that kind of gets to a little bit of this question around the desire and need to unsettle mainstream approaches to dramaturgy, but also like what happens when that when that work or when those perspectives start to become trendy or hyper visible, and what what happens to those people who are kind of put at the center of that hyper visibility, and what are what happens to the people who are put outside that center of hyper visibility? So, um, I think in the U.S. Um, from what I heard from Tara, there's like just one or two theater makers who are really getting a lot of the, the work right now. And while it's great that we're having a lot more indigenous theater happening on big stages, um, what happens when these two people, for example, represent the entirety of 570 plus indigenous nations in the US? Um, you know, what happens to us who are those people, like our perspectives not being put forth on the stage or in dramaturgical work, but also what happens to those people who are being put at the center of being asked to be accountable to the companies that they're working with, being accountable to their tribal nations, and also being accountable to the, the other tribal nations and the other indigenous makers um, on these lands. So I just think it's really interesting to think about hypervisibility because at least in the Southeast, Indigenous people were thinking a lot about invisibility and erasure um, because that is such a strong dynamic. So what happens when it kind of flips to the other side and hyper-visibility becomes the primary dynamic, um, which apparently is, is kind of happening in theater right now. So that's just a, a thought that I was having um, from that really interesting conversation I got to have with Jill and Tara beforehand. Yeah, and so I'll jump in from there. I have my four minute timer ready going on the side. I was a speech and debate in high school, so you know, I was talking. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you, Ruth, for starting out with that and talking a little bit about our conversation. Um, because what, thinking about these questions that we have in the, our conversations in general, and just my practice individually, because um, for me, individually, as a native artist, I don't just work in Oklahoma. Um, this year, I've actually been from coast to coast, which is really exciting. Um, doing native theater, which is the very first for me, 
Um, like I've never done a full year of just Native Theater, and here we are doing it. So that's wonderful. Yes, air guitar, I love it. Um, but that comes with a lot of challenges. Like I just left a process, and it was not good. Uh, whatever the step right before right before traumatic is, is that's what it was. Um, he's doing a very difficult work about a um, very young Native woman who was um, sexually assaulted, who was kidnapped, and then was murdered. Um, and we don't know what her names are today. Spoiler, I guess you can find out if you Google. Anyway, but we can have this. Um, also, her real name of Matoka. It is always working on a new play about that. Um, native playwright, native actress, native designer, so it's great. How little did non native theater company. Um, and so, but what happens there is, is that um, since there is, as, as I've said before, it's getting kind of like cool and trendy to do native theater now. Um, you know, it's like Arena Stage, Arden Shakespeare Festival, Planet's Horizons, Portland Center Stage. They are, you know, producing native work. Um, is is that the it opens the door, especially for native women, that fetishization of native women. And so specifically with Pocahontas, because of Disney, um, she's been hypersexualized, and that is also translated to native women today living in on this continent, um, with our sexual assault rates being the highest of any other group who are the smallest population in the United States, um, specifically. And with that is, is that I was in a situation where I had artistic leadership wanting to thrust their I did uh, like their really fetish of what Pocahontas should be, um, and it got really inappropriate really quickly. And so when we talk about doing that with that tension between like wanting to do native theater to give it visibility. Um, to go to non-native theater companies and produce native work is, is that it's always within the structure of settler colonialism, um, always within that structure of manifest destiny that everything on this land, women included, belong to quote unquote me. Um, and it's problematic because I want to continue to be hired um, and as a director who's being hired by another theater company, of course, I have to report to the artistic director um, so if I want to continue to, you know, make a living, uh, need to compromise in some sort of ways, but it's like, well, where is that line between having collaborative conversations about the artistry and completely reiterating settler colonialism, this federalization and over sexualization of Native women, especially as we're in the midst of this huge movement around missing and murder of indigenous women. Um, it's always tricky. And so if I'm thinking about like what would indigenous dramaturgy mean to me, it would mean a full trust on act by those who are not indigenous to give over the time, the resources, the access to opportunity. The next door thing. Because here's the thing, in my experience with non oh there's my time, I'm almost done. My little class is this. Ah. Um, so the thing with native theater and non-native audiences in my experience is that non-native audiences really get energized by native theater because native theater is a ceremony, it is spiritual. It hits on these multi, on these super deep, visceral, multi-level places um, in audiences, and so it's Understanding that doing something new, it does not always mean it's going to be a financial risk. It's sort of why I'm living in that space. Um, especially as we are in a capitalistic society, in a capitalistic field, and you know, it's just the nature of nonprofits, having to worry about where the money's coming from, um, and all that jazz. But yeah, so it's a tricky balance between all of those things. Um, and the last thing that I will leave is, is that whenever, just think, pro tip from my last experience, um, Whenever an indigenous artist, you know, spends hours and hours and hours among so many buckets of emotional labor um, and rehashing intergenerational trauma, to write dramaturgical packets, to write cultural sensitivity guides, really use them um, and really read them. And um, also knowing that every indigenous person, just like every um, uh, uh, disabled person, every X person, whatever you want to say, does not speak for their entire community. Um, they are not um, like an expert of their communities. 
but also acknowledging that, that they can offer their individual perspective from where they live in their intersections, um, and that we will convey that forward. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Alan. So, hello again, I'm Jill. Um, okay, um, so I'll tell you a story. Um, I, as, you, as I mentioned, I work at the University of Toronto, and a very central, a central uh, organ, organization, and, uh, 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 a central place, center at the University of Toronto is a place called Heart House. It's a gathering house, it has a house as a theater, it's a great old gothic structure with a clock tower and a war memorial to the war dead. Uh, uh, the royal, the royalty has passed through there, yada yada yada. There are fancy dining halls there, there are meeting rooms and dialogue and arts going on. So it's been a structure for uh, uh, on a campus that has a uh, university that has existed on these lands for almost 200 years. This university is actually older than Canada itself. So here's this place called Hardos Manor Theatre. Hardos Theatre, which people think of a lot as uh, in Canada as student productions, has brought out, has uh, nurtured some of the um, uh, national, national stars uh, of theater history and playwrights. So people like William Shatner came through. Uh, uh, it's 670. Sorry, my computer. Her house theater. And I do have my timer on, by the way. I don't think that looks good. It's not going anywhere. Oh, I'm pressing it now. <laughs> um, and uh, so this has been a colonial bastion of storytelling uh, and culture making. Uh, not only for this university, but for Toronto and then across the nation um, for some years. Uh, it's reaching its 100th birthday this year, this coming year, um, and uh, it was about to produce for its 100th birthday uh, uh, because a very well-known, you know, very well-known pillar of Canadian theater wanted to direct a play, some of you may recognize this from the description, a play by a settler Canadian playwright about um, a young native girl uh, and her boyfriend and her partner who leave their reserve and cannot survive in the city. And they're of course fated uh, to die horribly in the streets of the main city because uh, because um, the Canadian society at all levels has failed them and unless Canada can give them what they need, they cannot survive. So this is a story that came out in 1967. Anyone recognize my hint? The Ecstasy of Rita Joe by George Rica. So uh, Lee Miracle, who is a well-known solo writer here, uh, I didn't even know this was happening. Lee Miracle apparently uh, uh, heard about this, flipped out and said, what the heck do you think you're doing? You want to start your 100th, 101st, 100th birthday and your sort of, you know, your, your path to reconciliation <laughs> by making this your native offering? <laughs> Um, so they very quickly retreated from that project and they began to consult with the, uh, with the, with the Native people around the campus uh, about what they'd like to do. So, I, you know, I went and I spoke to them and I said, well, I can give you a list of playwrights as long as you're armed and a list of plays and you can produce one of these plays or you could commission one of these playwrights to write you a whole new play for your 100th birthday and your your newfound declaration to reconcile and open, you know, decolonize, decolonize the stones on which your ivy grows. And, um, and then I said, or, instead of having one little show to tick off your indigenous box, instead of having one little show where people can come and watch us on stage, 
and then say, well, we saw this and tick off the box. You could, you could call people on this campus into a project where they have to reveal themselves, um, where they have to enter into conversation with young indigenous people and work out this thing called relationship building. And what are they going to do and reveal themselves in a creative and artful process? Um, basically through the process of story weaving. I told them you should hire Miriam McGill from Spider Woman Theatre, have her come up and do this show. Well, they didn't quite have the money to do that, so they they asked me, um, second best, third best, fourth best, <laughs> and uh, I've agreed to do it. Um, I've agreed to do it um, because I think it's important to intervene on that. Uh, uh, the eye is on us. The eye is not on us. The eye should not be on us. I do my my work uh, as a dramaturg is to is to say, be one more moment. I am not your author. Oh, shut up. Uh, I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to make it go. Okay, I'll just stop now because <laughs> sorry, my timer is gone and it's killed me. I'll come back at this time. Sorry, um, give me one more second. Um, it's to take the, author uh, the authority away. Yeah. It's to change the structure of storytelling. In my community, storytelling is a, com is a communal enterprise. So the elder begins and then expects us to participate, take on, to witness fully and then participate in the telling of that story and the making. When a creation story is told, it be creation, recreation, begin anew in us. We become the agents. We are not just passive spectators listening to a fictive or finished action. We are continuing that action. And if this is an action in Canada, this moment of quote, truth and reconciliation, an action in Canada where these colonial bastions will change their ways, where the walls will tumble down, where access will truly be initiated, then it is behooves the settler faculty here, the settler staff here, the settler students, along with the indigenous the ind indigenous faculty students and staff and indigenous community members to come in and begin to do that work together and to make commitments, public commitments, on a public stage, on a, on a stage that is part of the national stage. So that's me and dramaturgy and structures. That's it. Sorry. Oh. Um. I guess that means I'm going. Um, so I don't usually identify what I do as crip dramaturgy. Um, I'm coming around to the term crip, but I haven't quite used it yet. I think, though, that um, what I'm interested in doing is really centering the perspective of disabled artists. And I've been realizing through our conversations in this group that there are a lot of similarities between the disabled community and the indigenous community. When we're talking about like hyper visibility versus invisibility and um, how it, our work can be kind of trendy sometimes and we need to be careful and unpack what is going into it and who's doing that work. Um, if it's 
it's kind of a cultural appropriation, I would say, when someone who is not disabled is not involved in some way, because disability does have a very specific culture, and it's important to recognize their perspective, the perspective of disabled artists, and um, so I think that working in this group, we're starting to see how we can build the cross-community solidarity. And I'm really excited to keep going with these conversations and talking about how we can unsettle access. Um, one thing is, I think that talking about access needs, sometimes we think about accommodations first, and that's not exactly what access needs are about. It's more about not assuming that everyone else is the same as I am, or is, has the same realities. So, um, I think that unsettling access needs to be a practice that comes into all spaces, like rehearsal spaces, because rehearsals are so ableist in their practices, and just talking about access needs completely changes the atmosphere. So, I think I'm going to keep rambling if you keep that microphone there. <laughs> um, I want to honor that we're at um, 540, 440, 340, 240, wherever you are in the world, 40 after, which is how long we said we would stay together. So. I don't feel the need to uh, enter the conversation. We can have conversations one-on-one -on -one here if you like. I want to honor that people probably need to go get their needs met, like food and like a rest. Um, but uh, I want to give great gratitude to my collaborators for um, being willing to expose parts of our practice, parts of the ways that we come together um, to groups of strangers both in this room and who are tuning in on how round or who will tune in on how round in the future uh, where this uh, will live forever online um, and uh, if you'd like to talk more about what we're up to please don't hesitate to come and chat with me uh, and again I will email out the questions that we were addressing today and I'm happy to share other aspects of what we're up to um, so thank you all so so much for uh, sharing this time and space with us and if you feel so moved do connect with your buddy and have a moment even a moment of reflection maybe it's not today maybe it's on Saturday um, maybe let it percolate what else yeah